Good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Still enjoying our brief 10-minute drive to get to church. That's a wonderful new development in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I know I could have, yeah. You know, it's better than the 25-minute drive all the time. So, uh, so happy Palm Sunday. Uh, today is the day that Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Um, and I'm actually going to read a little bit about what happened just before that. Um, I'm going to read from John chapter 12 this morning. Jesus anointed at Bethany. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, or held the money, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me you, you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, that because that by many that because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And as I read this this morning, I was struck by a couple things. Um, there's a type of worship that Mary represents in this passage of scripture, and you know I've talked about, and we went to the house of prayer or the the burn, the 24 hour prayer room two times ago, and there's a kind of worship that is so intimate that it's offensive to some, mm -hmm. and especially the religious, and especially people who don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It's, it's offensive. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we saw someone who was worshiping, and they covered her up. And it's almost like she was not going to have her worship covered because she kept wiggling out from under the covers. <laughs> and they would come and cover her up again. And I kid you not, they covered her like five times, and I'm like, just let her worship. Let her be. Like, she is not offending anybody. And, and I know for modesty's sake, we try to cover people, but it was her face that they kept trying to cover up. And she was having none of She was with the Lord, and she was rejoicing and worshiping. And, and it just struck me. And I've been pondering about this a lot. I'm like, what is it about intimate worship that is so offensive to some people? That they're just uncomfortable. That there is an intimacy that we have with Jesus Christ. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to make us uncomfortable. In fact, it increases his presence in the atmosphere where we are. Yes. And I'm so thankful that we are in a house of prayer that is safe to come and worship as we choose and that we can invite him in and worship him in any way. And that is the precious ointment that he seeks. That is the costly ointment that led, um, that was so important as a signature before he went to the, to the cross and died and rose again. The second thing that struck me about this passage was Lazarus. Ra Lazarus was a walking miracle. This was a man who was die who died, whose body stinketh <laughs> in the tomb, uh, and that walked out, rose again, um, as a sign of what was to come, I think, for Jesus as well as for the glory of the kingdom. And the Jews, it wasn't good enough just to kill Jesus. Now they wanted to kill Lazarus too. And so I'm telling you that when you receive your miracle, don't be surprised if people want to stone you for it or if people don't want to hear it or if they reject it or if they want to just poo-poo it. Your miracle is your miracle. Amen. You are a walking, Amen. every one of us are a walking testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. And whether they want to hear about it or whether they want to believe on it is not our concern. We are proof. We are proof that he redeems and he makes all things new. We are proof that we are a new creation. We have nothing to be ashamed of, that we are new creatures. We are new people filled with the Holy Spirit and born again. Amen. And so it was because of the anointing of Mary, because of that intimate worship, that I encourage you all 
to worship. However you are comfortable worshiping, however you want to try to worship. I love seeing the young people with the flags. I love seeing people. I know Cindy was saying if she can get enough fabric, she wants a big flag. So I'm praying that she can get a big flag. She's like, I want a lot of fabric for a really big flag. I'm like, you wave that flag, Cindy. We'll get you some fabric. (laughs) Worship however it brings you joy because it brings him joy and it brings all of us into the presence of the Lord together, which is what we all come here to seek. And you know what? Be that walking testimony of the grace of Jesus Christ that we all are. I know that um, Joyce Meyer did a wonderful teaching that we are trophies of grace, that we are on God's trophy shelf. Because he said, look what I did in this one. Look what I did in this one. Look how I redeemed this one. Look how I turned this one's life around. We are trophies and we are, he's proud of what he's done in us. And we're not done. We're not finished until we leave this world. And so I encourage you all, we are trophies of God's grace. And go tell everybody about it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nia, prayer requests or any testimonies this morning? Anybody? Yes. Just uh, remember her two little ones. She got a little upset last night. She's doing fine. Okay, good. Let's pray for Nia as well. Anyone else this morning? Yes. Yes, Donna. I uh, maybe <laughs> the rest of the experience uh, kind of lows or bumps along the way, or uh, uh, anticipations you want, uh, you know, and all, and uh, or sometimes just uh, you have wants that are not fulfilled, and uh, and what's the Lord? Praise the Lord. Yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, I just thought to most of you probably seen this on the news. This young guy in Bonaventure uh, uh, killed his family, and we don't know a lot. Tammy actually worked uh, with the with the father, <coughs> so she had a little bit more inside information there. But that's aside. This guy's got a lot of problems. Using it, obviously it's a horrible act. It's demonic in its source, but he's had a lot of mental problems and on medications and different things, and didn't, apparently didn't work. And I'm thinking he's going to have to live with this the rest of his life. He's only 20 years old, 21 years old, and unless he is the devil incarnate, he's going to be tormented. So I'd like us to, to remember him as well as the rest of the extended family with his grandparents and Amen. cousins and so on. So Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 Y
this morning. Let's stand and go to the Lord this morning. ask you to comfort this family in Bondurant, Lord, that you would minister to this young man who is so lost right now. Lord, that we know that you can change a heart. Lord, that
that you encourage that family, let them draw upon your grace and your mercy in this time of need, Lord, that you are our hope and our strength when we face dark things of this world, Lord. Lord, cancer, Lord, cancer for this friend of Tim's, Lord, that it is gone in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the good report, Dan's friend from work, Lord, the colon cancer, gone in the name of Jesus. Lord, for every need this morning, Lord, the needs that James has mentioned this morning, Lord, comfort for those who need comfort, Lord, healing for those who need healing, Lord. Yes, Lord. Peace, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Be with Sally this morning, Lord. She deals with the two, the crown, Lord. Be with Sally and bless her, Lord, with your for all those who couldn't be here today, Lord, let them know that they're missed, Lord. Bless them wherever they are. Jesus, we come into your house, Lord, this house of prayer, to seek after you, Lord, to lift you up and magnify the name of Jesus. You said that if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men unto you. So right now, Jesus, we lift you up, glorified, resurrected, full of grace and mercy for whosoever will. Jesus, you are good. You are good and you are gracious. You are our healer. You make all things new, Lord. You took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And you said, just put your hope and your trust in me. And you will not. You will not be disappointed. Oh, we love you this morning, Lord. Come in our midst, Lord. Have your way in this service. As we come to worship in spirit and truth, as we come to hear the word and be transformed by it, renew our minds this morning by the hearing of your word. Let us be transformed into your image from glory to glory, day by day, Lord. We run this race, Lord, pressing forward, letting go of what lays behind and pressing forward to the mark that you have set before each one of us, created for this time with for a purpose. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us and called us by name. And we say, we declare that you are good. You are good, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Come and have your way this morning. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise the Lord, Jayla. You praise the Lord, sister. That's right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. I think we have some announcements this morning. If you brought a cell phone with you, please remind her to turn off the ringer and go ahead and turn it off. Uh, April 14th, favorite Friday night of the month. Eastern Gate House Prayer. Good Friday. Oh, I like um, this one. I got woke up at 3 o'clock this morning. We're going to bring a few tables up here and spread them across. We're going to have 13 chairs. The Lord's going to sit in the middle, and we're going to take communion along. <laughs> it's going to look like the last time. I don't know. I'm going to challenge Michael to see if he can get a picture of this. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're just going to, we're just going to, uh, and I saw this, uh, what, seven hours ago. Praise I got woke up with this. So, yeah, we'll spread all that, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have communion in the midst of it. We're just going to remember what the Lord has done. And mm -hmm. the work is finished. So, yeah, amen. Amen. Is finished. Praise God. And women of influence, daughters of the king. Finally, we have postcard invitations. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we finally found our printer. <laughs> um, postcards in the back. Please take one for yourself. Please take two to hand out to friends. Um, we are planning to go from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. It's come and go. Free will offering. There'll be a lunch. Um, we'll probably start with worship at 10. Um, those of you that are going to be speaking, we will communicate. We'll get um, a talk space with Sarah, and we'll be kind of telling you approximately when you'll be speaking <laughs> and working with everybody's schedules. I know softball started for, for Jody and some others uh, for their children. So please come, ladies. Don't miss it. Bring a friend. Bring five, and we will have a wonderful time of fellowship in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and you ladies, uh, it's, it's going to be, uh, all the ladies are going to be singing. So if you haven't sang here before, and you're, uh, can make a joyful noise. Uh, <laughs> rule number one is with the guys, we can help them instrumentally, but we're not allowed to sing. So that, oh. leaves, that leaves it all on you ladies. Oh, okay? okay. So if, if you think you can <laughs> sing, whatever, um, I, if, if, if what I'm 
seeing thing that happens is I'll actually move this keyboard off and we'll line microphones across uh, for you ladies, all right? So I'm just testing the bread on the water. <laughs> if you chaw on it, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, well, let's speak the word together this morning. Will you not, not revive us again, again that, that your people, people may rejoice in, in you? you? Yes, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function, and I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes, Lord. Uh, let's see. Do you want to come take the offering? And Don, you want to come take the offering this morning? Please? Don, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Ron. I did say Don. <laughs> Ron, Don. I did call you Don. My bad. <laughs> Do you want to ask the... Father, thank you so Jesus. much for this blessed day. Because of you, Lord Jesus, we are more than conquerors. Yes. yes. Shine your light on your servant today. Yes, yes Lord. Lord. Bless this offering we're about to receive. Yes. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We will see him, and we can see him right now. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just open the eyes of the spirit. Praise God. He's with us. He's in us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give him one more hand clap. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you all. You may be seated. And uh, any of the young people can go downstairs. Thank you, Suzanne, for opening. Thank you for sharing with us. Amen. Good. As always, praise the Lord. And Mike and the worship team, thank you all very much. Praise the Lord. (coughs) Hallelujah, Jesus. thinking when Suzanne was was talking about uh, John chapter 12 and the thing that stood out to me in fact I was just looking at that the other day and, and what all she said was right and, and great I'm not tr- I'm not taking away from that I'm just saying something that I saw was it says there were certain Greeks there and if you remember, you know, when Paul spoke to him once and he said, you know, uh, perceive you to be religious people and, you know, that uh, I came to talk to you about there was all these statues for different gods. And he said, I came to talk to you about the unknown God, the one statue they had that said unknown. And he said, that's the God that created everything. And these Jews were a lot, or these, uh, excuse me, these Greeks that were there that day happened to be a lot like the Jews that were there that day, sadly. They were, they were kind of interested in what was going on. Lazarus was there. It talks about Lazarus. So there was a lot of, a lot of just uh, kind of uh, an interest in the, in the magic, you know, or in the, what you might call the supernatural, which is what actually was, but it's more of a magic kind of thing to the, in their way of thinking. So they were interested in seeing this guy that had raised this guy from the dead. Now, some of them, they were acting out a prophetic word from God, from the Old Testament that said that they, on the foal of an ass, he'll ride into Jerusalem and so on and so forth, and people will shout Hosanna. But the truth is, they were really more interested in the spectacle and in the kind of strangeness of it all. Because if you remember, Jesus uh, later in Luke, it talks about it. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The same people who had been throwing palm branches in front of him and shouting Hosanna were the ones that he spoke to and said, uh, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. You that kill the prophets. And, you know, so... um, I think sometimes when we're talking about, this is Palm Sunday, obviously, and when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, it was an opportunity. In fact, it was one of the last opportunities Israel was going to have in the natural life of Christ to embrace him, to receive him as their Lord and Savior, as their King, as their Messiah. And they rejected him. Now, it looked like in the natural, it looked like they were all in. I mean, it looked like it was all, you know, except for a few of the rabbis that were complaining because they were worshiping him as God. But even the people turned against him and shouted and carried on for his crucifixion. So to me, I'm just saying sometimes what we call worship isn't worship at all. It's just interest in in an activity. And if we don't embrace Christ, if we don't receive him through that process, we've just been a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I'm not accusing anybody of that here today. I'm just saying we have to remember this Jesus is to be received. Amen. Not to be looked upon. Not to be inspected, but to be received into us. And in fact, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures back, but... 
You know why the devil hates you? And he does hate you. He hates you because you've got what he wants. Everything he strove for was authority, power, the image of God, to be worshipped as God. And God has placed himself inside you. And he's given you power and he's given you authority. And the devil hates it because he can't have it. And because God gave it to something lower than, a little lower, amen, than himself. Praise the Lord. But in Numbers chapter 22, and you don't have to go there, Sheila, I'm just still rambling here. But in, in Numbers 22, there's the story about, remember, you know, Balak. Balaam, Balak is a type of, uh, of Satan. And he gets this false prophet to come because he wants to curse the people of God. The people that were connected with God, the children of God at that time. And so he comes, and, and in fact, he says, go and curse these people and, and just get them out of my hair. Attack them. Destroy them. And so Balaam goes to do this thing, to curse them, and God speaks to him and tells him, you can't do it. You can't curse what I've blessed. So he tries anyway. He tries over and over to curse him, and every time he tries to, God shuts his mouth. Then in Numbers chapter uh, 23, the very next chapter, he goes out one more time to try this, and God stops him, and he blesses. In the middle of his cursing, he starts blessing Israel because you can't get the curse out. God won't allow him to curse him. And then Balak, the type of Satan, he says, don't try to curse them and don't try to bless them. Just stop. Just leave them alone. In other words, he just says, don't mess with them. Just, just stop because it's getting worse. The harder you're, I'm trying to get them cursed, the more God is blessing them. Amen. Why? Because God was with Israel. Now, it doesn't mean the enemy doesn't come and try to curse you, try to bring sickness and disease and poverty and dysfunction and all the rest of the stuff. Yes, he does. But if you would just say what God says about you, you can stop the curse. You can stop the enemy just by declaring what God has already said about you. You are blessed. You are more than a conqueror. By his stripes, you were healed. You are prospered. Amen? Somebody's got to speak for God. God's in here now. Praise the Lord. And Satan is, still comes to try to curse us, but somebody's got to say what God says to shut his mouth. Because his, his agenda has not changed. He's still doing what he's always done. In Galatians chapter 4, it says that, you know, we should, now that he says, now that you know God, or, and then he kind of, corrects himself, he said, or rather that God knows you, or that you are known of God is actually the, 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 the words that he used. Think of it. God, I'm known of God. Billions of people have been on this planet, millions and millions and millions, maybe billions now. But I am known of God. That may not mean anything to you, but that's powerful to me. God knows me inside out. He knows things about me that I don't even know. I am known of God because I'm one with God. We've got to stop knowing God from the outside in we got to start knowing him the way he knows us from the inside out. Instead of standing on the side and watching a parade and throwing a few hallelujahs and praise the Lord's out there, we should, have, we should know that he is in us. We should know. We should be aware of that. We can celebrate. We can praise him. We can worship him 24 hours a day, seven days a week without any hindrance whatsoever. And it will shut the mouth of the devil when we do it. 
were known of God. He is a spirit. He knows us by our spirit from the inside out, who we really are. And we need to know God the same way from the inside out. Stop looking for something outside and start manifesting something from inside. I'll just say it again because it's worth repeating. Stop looking for things out here when God is in here. And the only way anybody's going to see anything of God is if you release it, not if he just shows up on the street corner somewhere. Start releasing God from our spirit, from the inside out, and God will be known by others as we are known of God. Praise the Lord. I'm going to just, I want to tell you just a little story, but it's appropriate. This guy, he, he walks into a cafe, and he's kind of had a rough time. He's really thirsty. He's, just, he's really just desperate for a Coke. You ever had one of those days where just a, a Pepsi, a, co a cola, you know, you just really, it would just make it, you know? And maybe at some time in your life there was some other drink that would have done that for you, but I'm just saying, this guy was desperate for a soda, for a Coca-Cola, praise the Lord, but he didn't have enough money for one. So he looks around the cafe, and here's this guy, there's another guy sitting there at the counter, and he, he walks over to him and he says, hey, let me... Let me make a deal with you. He said, I'll ask myself a question, and if I answer it, then you've got to buy me a Coke. <laughs> and then he said, you can ask yourself a question, and if you answer it, I'll buy you a Coke. And the guy says, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, how's that going to work? He said, well, we'll just keep asking ourselves until one of us can't answer. Right? And then that guy's got to buy the coat. So he says, okay. So the first guy that, that started this conversation, he says, how can a rabbit dig a hole without putting any dirt outside of the hole? The guy looks at him. The guy that asks the question then answers his question. He says, well, he digs it from the inside out. So the second guy says, well, how can he do that? He said, that's your question. <laughs> he answered his question, right? He digs it from the inside out. Well, obviously, he got a Coke. <laughs> but my point is, this is all about from the inside out. And we're asking questions that don't make sense because we're asking them from the outside in. We're looking for things that only we can manifest. We're looking for people to do something that God's already done. So with that, let's go to Exodus chapter 33, verses 15 and 16. You know, we are spiritual people. We are powerful people. We have the ability to heal the sick, raise the dead, say, oh, I've never seen it. I don't care what you've seen or haven't seen. I'm just telling you what the Bible says you have the, the capacity to do. And greater works than these you are capable of doing. So something about the way we're operating isn't in sync with what the Word of God says. So I'm saying we need to be saying what the Word of God says if we're going to get the results that God has that he has declared each of us to produce. And it only happens when we're focused on the God that's in us rather than the little gods that are around us. Praise the Lord. So then he said unto him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except that you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15. How many of you know you are sanctified? You're not getting sanctified. You are sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. You've been set apart to God. Amen? 
If you're not, you're not going anywhere any, any, any more than what was just spoken here. Unless God's with me, I'm not moving. I'm not going anywhere. Well, the good news is God is always with me, so I could go anywhere and have an impact if I'm aware of the fact that God is in me, that God is with me. All right? So here he says, whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. And he in God. Look at that and read it to yourself. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. How many of you in here believe Jesus is the Son of God? Okay. Then I can say of an assurity that Jesus is the Son of God, that God abides in you. God is in you. He's not hovering around somewhere outside of you. He's not floating around out here waiting for you to get up enough faith to grab him and bring him in. He's already in you. And you are in him. You and God are one. And if we don't remind ourselves of this about 24 hours of the day, then we're operating as though God is off on some other planet, busy with a bunch of stuff, and we don't know if he's going to show up on time to do what it is we've got to have done or need or have a problem with. Amen? We're busy trying to get God to show up when God is waiting for us to show out. 24. Praise the Lord. Power is in the presence. And we have the presence. He is present in us 24-7. And the power is in that reality. You can do all things through Christ. Because He's in you, strengthening you. Giving, him, giving you God power. God authority. John 14, verse 6, Sheila. You know, a lot of our language, you know, English language is so weird because, you know, it's, you know we talked about it before, you know, the, did the house burn up or did the house burn down? You know, we just say stuff all the time that just, you know, to somebody who doesn't, understand the language enough to have it all messed up, they hear you talking, they don't know what you're saying half the time. You know what I mean? If there's a foreigner trying to learn the language. And I'm saying we, t we do the same thing with, with Christian language, Christianese. We say stuff, we don't realize that the things we're saying mess us up. Now, he's, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I, what I mean by that is, I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand, you and God are one. Jesus is in you. You don't need to get him to come and show up. You need to let him out. You need to act on that truth. Instead of waiting for a feeling or for some vision or some other thing to show up and make you feel like now God's here. Because God's here whether you get a goosebump or don't get a goosebump. If you get one, great. That's, that's hallelujah for that. I love it when that happens. But even if I don't, he's still here. But he is bound by me now. He is still in flesh. He's not legal here unless he's in flesh. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come in, in the person of Christ in the first place. Satan is illegal here. He's a spirit, but he doesn't have a body, so he's got to get in a body to operate. So Jesus said to him, I am the way. Now look at the way he says this. I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I'll give you life, or I'm pointing the way. He said, I am the life. I am the way. In Matthew, he's, when he's being crucified, he says, uh, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he had become sin for you and me. And so God forsakes him, separates from him, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ, so that we could be one with God. That's the transaction. 
That's the great exchange. How much of God was in Jesus? It's not a trick question. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. The scripture tells us that. God, the fullness of the Godhead, left him. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And though God didn't say it, we know from the scripture that what he, what he could have said was, because I'm going to them who are now righteous the way you were righteous before you took all their sin. So when you get born again, you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you. Otherwise, Jesus gave us a, you know, a partial exchange. Are you with me? So you can do what he did. But you've got to know what he knew. And the only way you can know that is by the word of God, not by what some jack leg preacher tells you or by what some, some, uh, somebody who wants to be spiritual tells you who doesn't understand it themselves. Half of the stuff that religion does is to try to make you feel like if I do all this stuff, then I will be like Jesus. And the more you're trying to do that stuff, the more you're denying what Jesus has already done for you. So it keeps you in, a, in a, a state of limbo, really, where we talk the way we talk, where Jesus is going to come alongside and do this thing. Well, if I pray long enough, God will show up and do something. And what we're doing is saying, what he did, he didn't do. When we should just be stepping out and doing it. He was condemned, separated from God. Right? Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Now we know if you're born again, you're in Christ, right? Because we've already read it. He's in you and, you, and, and, and we're in him. Right? If you have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. So this is not a, this is not a, a if you do the right thing now. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's you. Amen? who do not walk according to the flesh. That's not saying here's a stipulation to that. It's saying because you are in Christ, you don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, because now your spirit man is alive, and that's who God's dealing with, not your flesh. And so religion and the devil wants to keep you convinced that your flesh is what we're talking about here, so every time you don't do something that's spiritual, you're not in Christ anymore. So here comes condemnation. And I'm telling you, he just made a blank statement here, or a blanket statement that says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are born again. Regardless. There cannot be because otherwise God could not be in you and you could not be in God. And how many times does he tell us, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Either he is, or else that's a lie, and we might as well throw this thing in the trash and everybody go home. Look at verse 38 and 39, same chapter here. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because you're in there. Now you say, what, am I, what are you talking about? I'm talking about resurrection because next week I don't know what I'm going to talk about. But I know what this is all about, what we're, what we're supposed to be dealing with this time of the year, what we should be dealing with every part of the year, but specifically this because we're, we're reminded of it all the time, because we know the Passover's coming, Resurrection Sunday, you can call it Easter if you want, I'm not paranoid about Ishtar and all that stuff, I know it's all garbage, but nevertheless, we're talking about Passover, we're talking about the resurrection of the Lord, so I don't freak out about it any more than I do Christmas being on the 25th of December. Because I'm in Christ, and Christ is in me, and I'm not worried about semantics. I'm, I'm concerned about realities here. And he says, 
He'll never leave us. Praise God. One with God. Genesis chapter 48, verses 8 through 20. See, we need some resurrecting going on in us. This Jesus in here needs to be resurrected in me. He needs to come alive again in me. Hallelujah. Because a lot of us have just been nothing but a tomb. I'm not talking about any of you specifically. I'm just talking about other people. But you know what I'm saying. All we've been is just a, a means to, to holding. But never letting out. Never letting go. Never roll away the stone. Always talking about, oh, what if, if Jesus were just here? I mean, we sound like the disciples before they got the Holy Spirit, before they got born again. Oh, my God. What we thought he was going to do. What, he thought, what we thought he could do. But, you know, they killed him. He's dead. We go back fishing now or go do something else or figure out some other way of trying to work our lives out. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, who are these? Remember Joseph? He married the Egyptian uh, daughter of a high-ranking uh, Egyptian official because he was cut off from his family and so forth. Well, they have two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and, and uh, then his father and them come back eventually, and they're, they're reconciled because of Joseph, the type of Christ. But now Jacob is old, Israel. And he's, he's about to die. So he's going to bless all of his sons, but he's blessing Joseph, and he's going to bless Joseph's sons. And here's what he says. Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, please bring them to me, and I'll bless them. This is Israel speaking, Jacob. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. And then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Not Joseph, Israel kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. Keep going. I want to go all the way down through 20. And so Joseph brought him out from his knees and bowed down the face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near him. That's important. He brings Ephraim to the right hand and, and uh, Manasseh to the left hand. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the youngest or the younger of the two. And his left hand went on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, even though he was dim of sight. He knew what he was doing. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head, trying to put him back to the way the traditional blessing should have been, right? Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people. He also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, by you, Israel, will bless, saying, my, may God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus, he set Ephraim before Manasseh. We get the double portion blessing that belongs to Jesus. Does the Bible not say we are the younger brother, mankind, that are born again? We got the blessing that belonged to Jesus. Praise the Lord. And, and you say, well, that, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said he'd be greater. Did Jesus not say, and greater works than these shall you do? 
because I go to my father to confirm the blessing, to validate the younger getting the greater. Because you didn't do anything for it. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. The older deserved it, but he didn't get it. Why? Because the father chose to make an exchange. And he did it because he was speaking prophetically to people who would live thousands of years later that would then recognize what a great thing this was because Joseph knew this isn't right. This isn't fair. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's grace. It's grace. Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ beside you, not Christ near us, not Christ on call if we need him, Christ in us. The power is in the presence and his presence is in us. It's inside out. How do you keep from making a mess when you're trying to do something from the Lord? You just do it from the inside out. You just do it from him and not from us. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. You say, well, I don't, but I don't understand how, Nathan. There's nothing to understand. That is religious claptrap. That is garbage. You don't need to know anything. You just do. There's not a five-step program here to laying hands on the sick and they recover. Somebody's sick, you lay hands on them, you pray for them in Jesus' name. You say what the Word of God says about their situation, and that's it. You got a financial situation, you don't need to have 50 different tape series and a thousand books and I'm not against any of that if that helps you to get to where you need to be but I'm just saying we end up focusing on somebody and something somebody said instead of what the word of God said the word of God says you lay hands on the sick they recover you cast out devils right Here's a th he, he said I've received all authority what does that tell you I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself but I'm telling you what that tells me is I have all authority if all authority was given to him. I've got all authority. Yes. Praise God. Who's, who, whose minds the God of this world has blinded who do not believe? Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So where did Satan get the title of being God of the world? He got it from Adam. Because Adam was the God of this world. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. He was God's offspring. He had authority. He had dominion. On earth as it is in heaven. Trying to bring heaven to earth. But what did he do? He gave it to Satan. He he he. he he allowed Satan to usurp that authority. He didn't actually even usurp it because Adam freely gave it to him. Right. Satan is the God of the world system. He's not your God. He's not my God. He doesn't have power over me. He's got power in the world systems. But he doesn't have power or authority over me as a believer. How can he have power over me that is one with God? Just think about the rational way of thinking would tell you, and it's it, it, just by definition, that can't be. That can't be possible. Amen. Only if we're deceived. Only if we're always looking for God to show up somewhere. Maybe the devil will get in here before God does because he's hanging right outside the door. And God is off on some other planet somewhere. 
The devil can't get to me quicker than God. He's in me. God and I are one. The devil's not, there's no way he can beat God to the situation. If it's the situation I'm going through, God's already there. John chapter 10 and verse 30. Hallelujah. We need, a, we need a resurrection, praise the Lord. We need one every day. We need one several times a day, praise God. I and my Father are one. Jesus said that, but I'm saying that. And you should say it. I and my Father are one. Then, that's great, that's good. But if I and my Father are one, then I've got to do what Jesus did after he made that statement. I only do what my Father does. I only say what my Father says. So I can't go running around repeating what somebody else said about me if I expect to get God results. You understand what I'm saying? Whether it's, you know, a banker or, or a lawyer or your doctor or, or just somebody you've had a, a beef with. They don't define you. God defines you. John chapter 17, verse 23. John 17, verse 23. I and my Father are one. God and I are one. We've, we've, we've read the scriptures, right? He's in me, I'm in him. Uh, he said he'd never leave me. It's a done deal. It's established. It's, set, it's settled forever. I and them, you and me, that they may be made. It's hard to say, isn't it? Perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Same connection, same relationship. You are perfect in Christ. Your spirit, your reborn reality cannot sin. Can not sin. If it could, God would not be able to be with you and in you. You are righteous, the righteousness of God in Christ. You've been made perfect because of that. We're still trying to get perfect so that we can be what we see Jesus is. But that isn't the reality. The reality is you've already been made perfect because he was made corrupt. Psalms chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. I mean, you've got to remind yourself of this because this flesh will do stuff that's going to just, you know, fight that all the time. But it's no different than the doctor's report saying one thing and the word of God saying something else. You were healed. No, you're not. You got a whole six months of chemo to go through. I'm healed. He said so. Well, you unrighteous jerk. I saw you, you know, you, 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 you did this thing or you said that thing or whatever. No, I'm perfect in Jesus. I'm perfect in Jesus. I love what Tim says. Oh, yeah, well, I knew you did this and you did that. That's B.C. So even if I do one of those B.C. things today, I'm still perfect in Jesus because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If I, I'm forever righteous. I'm forever holy. I'm forever perfected. I'm forever sanctified. If I weren't, he could not have given me the, the command to go and do these things. Lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, and so on and so forth. Greater works than these shall you do. It would, have been, it would have been a torment for him to do that if it weren't a fact. So to the chief musician on the instrument of death, 
a psalm of David, O Lord, o our, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. <clears throat> Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. All right? God ordained strength to come out of the mouth of babes, the younger. That's us. Strength will come out of their mouths because of enemies. There it is. Defeats the enemy. Sword of the Spirit. When we speak it, I don't know how old Satan is. He's older than me. And I, I'm not that young, praise the Lord. But to him, I'm a babe. To God, we're babes. And he said, out of their mouth will come what defeats the enemy. In other words, God says, my power will flow from my children. Strength will come out of their mouths because of the enemy. Right? Balak, curse him, Balaam. I can't. Every time I try, a word comes from God that says, bless him. That God is now in us. And when we speak in agreement with him, we shut the mouth of the devourer. We defeat the one that wants to curse us with the word of God. We do it because the enemy is trying to deceive you. The creative power of God will work for you when you speak on the authority of God's word recognizing I'm just saying what my father says. I'm just doing what my father does because I and my father are one. Can you see it? It's not complicated. We make it complicated. We, we make it about all kinds of stuff. But he's given us the blueprint. He's given us the prototype. He's given us the whole plan. All right, go back. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Come on, church. We've got, to, uh, we've got to grow up, man up, and by that I don't mean male, gender. I mean yes. as men and women, as mankind filled with God. We've got to start acting like who we are. Yeah. We've got to stop playing these religious games of trying that this is going to happen and we're going to make this happen. You know, if God is going to show up here someday and God's going to do this and God's, God ain't going to do anything, pardon my English, until we do something. He's already invested all of his power and authority in us. That's like, that's like hiring, you know, you've got a, a, a corporation that you're running and you hire a, a, a manager, somebody to manage the business. And then you've got to go off on your whatever and you're gone for two or three weeks, and you come back, and nobody's done anything. You say, why? What? Well, we were waiting for you. You're the, I made you the manager, man. That's why, you get, that's why you're getting a check every month to do what I told you to do. Oh, but I, I was afraid I'd make a mistake. My God, a mistake is better than nothing. At least I know you're... Stepping out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, keep the analogy going here. We are the body, individually, of God on this earth. We're Jesus. We're like Jesus. Right? We've already been told. We're the younger brother. We've been given greater authority to do greater works. Right? All power, he says, is given to me. Go ye therefore. He's on his way out of here. He's leaving us the spirit. All power is given to me. So you've got all power now. 
Well, then maybe we ought to figure out how does this power work? Instead of constantly calling for the boss to come back, maybe we ought to manage what it is that God has already given us, told us we're supposed to be operating in, and we're sitting around waiting, hope he gets off a vacation pretty quick because this thing's about to collapse. The spirit was moving, right? Oh, if we could just get a move of the spirit. I don't, I'm not trying to be mocking here. God knows my heart. But I'm, just, I'm using the same analogy that we end up playing into all the time. The spirit was moving, but nothing was happening. It looked good. Woo. Did you feel that? Yeah, but I didn't see anything. Nothing happened. Nothing changed. Nothing changed until God spoke the image that was inside him. Light be. Light. Even though God had the image inside of him, and the Spirit of God was there to cause it to come to pass, it had to be released out of his mouth before anything changed. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, the enemy will be defeated. Darkness will be overcome with light. Healing over sickness. Prosperity over poverty. Jesus over Satan. You were born again by the word of God. That's what the scripture says. You have to speak that image. You have to give voice to it. Or you'll just be standing there waiting for it to get light. You may feel goosebumps. Might get a little chill. Might even talk in tongues but it's still dark. There needs to be a resurrection in each of us. God created us in his image and his likeness. And let me tell you something, church, everything produces after its own kind. So we're either going to work from the inside out and produce God works, or we're going to be working from the outside in, and all we're going to have is a pile of dirt. Praise the Lord. So Genesis 1 reads, you know, it reads the way it does so that you're going to know how God does creative works. And God said, and God said, and God said. Ten times in Genesis 1, God said. And what God said was. Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Let me say that again. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And we've already talked about it. It's illegal for God to come as God to this earth in spirit, just to operate, right? To just, just destroy the work of the devil and go on. God gave authority, that authority, to Adam. Adam gives it to Satan, turned it over to Satan, right? Jesus God in the flesh, not operating as God, but operating as you and I can, as a, as a human being filled with the Godhead. Praise the Lord, he comes, and he takes that authority away from the devil. And he gives it to us. He did it as a man filled with God, operating strictly by God's word. He takes the authority back, and now... 
All authority is given to me, right? Because I got it. I took it back. Go you, therefore. Because now you have all authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's not complicated. It's only complicated because we try to sift it through what the crap we've already learned that is bogus. And we perpetuate it sometimes in our endeavor to, you know, to, to, to have a move of God, not realizing if there's ever going to be a move of God, it's got to come right here. It's got to come right out of you or me. It can't come because we sing enough songs. I'm all for singing songs because it, it does what it's supposed to do. It brings us into an awareness of God's presence. But it doesn't bring God's presence. It makes us conscious of that presence. So we will release it. It's not, we're not worshiping, and Mike knows this, we're not worshiping to get God to show up. That would be counterproductive. Why, why would we spend all the time doing that if he's already here? We're worshiping because he is here. We're worshiping his presence. We're worshiping him. And it makes us aware. He is here. He is me. So somebody's sick. What do we do? Do we wait for a manifestation of Jesus to come and lay hands on him? No. We are moved to lay hands on the sick. Why? Because that's what God is doing. That's what God always did. And he's in me now. See, we've, we're actually, we we debate ourselves this way. On the one hand, we're the ones laying hands on the sick. But you see what I'm saying is from the inside out. Because if it's anything other than that, all of a sudden I become a healing minister. Which is just crap. I can minister healing by the Spirit of Jesus. But I, it's not my ministry. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. This is just, I've been saying this all along, but just so you see it in the scripture. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Resurrection, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to talk about, do what I would do. Do what I did. Greater works. Praise God. James chapter 1, verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Mm -hmm. Now, how many of you know, the moment you got born again, your natural face is right here. It's not what you're looking at in the mirror at home. This is the mirror. God's word. It's not, it's, it's not supernatural for us. It's supernatural with people who are not supernatural. To supernatural people, it's natural. You see what I'm saying? We're still trying to make supernatural stuff happen from a natural source. It doesn't work that way. We are already supernatural. Naturally. So the glass that James is talking about is the Word of God. The natural face is the face that you inherited when you got born again. God's face, spirit, right? His image. That's how you were created, in his image. So you look into the word, you see what God says about you, and you say, look what I inherited. Whoa. Whoa. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Yes. Nothing shall be impossible to me. Right. I can do all things mm -hmm. through Christ who strengthens me. And then we go out and we face the circumstances of life 
and uncomfortable situations, then we forget what manner of man we are, what kind of mankind we are. And unless you act on the word of God, the oneness of God, with God, and the word of God, you're no different than everybody else out there that's unsaved. And that's where 90%, I would say 90%, although I may be exaggerating here, just but speaking evangelistically, most of the church is. We talk about it, we dance about it, we shout about it, but we don't do it. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, Sheila. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. You're doing a great job. In fact, you're doing better than I am because I don't even know when it's up there or not. I only wear these to see. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, verse 15 says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, I know you, you may think, well, that's great. You know, I mean, it's scripture, it's in there and all that. But I, I'm not going through all of these because some of this stuff is personal. But I've been confessing this for years. The, that scripture... When we moved from that trailer park over on the south side out by the airport into this building, that was one of the scriptures that we chose when we were having Wednesday night Bible studies and there were like two or three of us there. That's grown. It's now five or six, praise the Lord. I'm just being sarcastic because I can. But my point is this. I do this. I've been doing this. I continue to do it. Say, well, I, you know, well, that's good for you. you. You know, you're a preacher. No, I'm a human being. I live seven days a week. I'm here too. And I got all the same stuff everybody else has got because I live in the same world and I got the same devil dealing with it. And I want to know something about what it is I'm supposed to be doing. And so I need revelation. I need to know what God is talking about. I don't want to just read it off the top of the page like I'm reading the Sunday paper. I need to know what's behind that word. And so do you. Praise the Lord. So that's great. But Paul didn't stop there. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 now, Sheila, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. That's shouting stuff right there, praise the Lord. For us Pentecostals, woo, I'm telling you, that is powerful stuff because God sees us quickened or alive together with Christ, alive with Christ, one with Christ. Where, in theological terms, is Jesus? Seated at the right hand of the Father. What does the right hand of the Father symbolize? Power. All power, Jesus said, is given to me. Therefore, I go to my Father, and you go do what I did. And then he tells us, not only am I seated in this position of power, but you are seated there with me because I'm in you and you're in me. Now, look at how anemic the church has been relative to that statement. 
the biggest things we've done have still been minuscule in comparison to what God wants us to be operating in. But you cannot do it just by wanting to do it. You have to operate the way Jesus operated. If you are Jesus, God's son, God's daughter, then you've got to do what you see your father doing. You've got to say what you hear your father saying. You can't just say what somebody else said because they read it in the book. You better say what this book says because, you know, look, everybody, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah, everybody, including me. That's why all these scriptures are up here. And that's why we have a Bible. So you don't just have to take my word for it. You can go read it for yourself. And then you can say, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he's lying, he made it up, or whatever. Or maybe I should do some of that. All right, John chapter 14, verse 23. We're about done here. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Keep the word. Speak the word. Believe the word. Operate in the word. You cannot, you cannot step out and make a statement of faith at one point. This is what happened to Peter. And I'm not, I'm not using the same old analogy, but I'm saying he stepped out on the boat in faith because he heard a word from the Lord, right? But he quit listening to the Lord and started listening to everything else. He could have walked clear across that lake if he'd have continued to focus on the Lord, on the word of God. But he didn't. He started listening to all the other stuff. That's what happens to us, and that's why we don't see the breakthroughs in a lot of areas of our life. Yes, we make a commitment. We pray and we say, Lord, I see you in your word. I'm healed. I'm prospered. I'm this. I'm that. I'm whatever it is. And I declare it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that it is finished. And it's not 24 hours because we didn't see an immediate manifestation outside. We start talking all kinds of crap that has nothing to do with what God has said. Uh-oh, got another bill today. Feel that? That's a pain. That's that's not good. That can't be good. I, you understand what I'm saying? We're we're digging from the outside in when we should be digging from the inside out. And we got a big pile of crap out here that's producing nothing. It's just a mess because we're not staying focused on what God has told us to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Last scripture. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6. You know, I know I, it may be uncomfortable for some of you if I say crap several times like that, but I could say a lot worse. It's in the Bible. It's, it's in here. Paul talks about it. I'm staying on the word. Hallelujah. I'm pushing the envelope a little bit, but I'm still in the word. Amen. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, which is what I just spoke of a moment ago. All power is given to me. Well, I'm at the right hand of the Father. Yep. And he says he's raised us up together and seated us in that same place. Paul said this in another scripture. He said, uh, I thus judge, if Christ died for all, then all are dead. Right? It's kind of like saying, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me that lives. It's, it's Christ. But he said, thus I, I judge. If Christ died for all, then all are dead. So listen to what Paul is saying. As far as God's concerned, we've already died. Not only that, he sees you alive, resurrected. Amen? Yeah. It's all a future event for us, but not for God. He's seen the end from the beginning. He knew us before the foundation of the world. Before any human being was on this planet, he already knew us. Because that's God. 
So he's saying in his mind, we've already died. And now we're alive again and seated together with Christ, raised up together with him. I mean, that is, <laughs> praise the Lord. What, is that, what does it mean? Well, among other things, all power is given to you. Your destiny is sealed. We're worrying about heaven. We're already there. As far as God's concerned, we're already there. Now, so why don't we just quit messing around with that and start bringing some heaven here and getting some other people on the rolls. Amen? You see what I'm saying? We, we're just, we, we, we're freaking out and worrying about stuff that is just not, it's a settled thing. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm, I've already been seated at Jesus' feet. I've already had conversations with him. I've already talked to some of the apostles. I've already talked to grandparents and great-great-grandparents and those that have gone before me that I didn't even know. I've already visited with them. You know why they're not up there wringing their hands? Well, I wonder, wonder when Alvin's coming. Mom is up there saying, wonder when Alvin will show up. No, Alvin's already been there. Alvin's already there. She's not wringing her hands. It's not a long time for her because she's in eternity. And so are we, spiritually speaking. That's why we grieve not as others. Because we're not like others. We're like our Father. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. So see yourself resurrected and live your life resurrected in Jesus' name. God bless you all dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great rest of the week.